My next guest, Congresswoman Mikey Sherrill of New Jersey, chairs the Environment Subcommittee of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Prior to this, she spent almost 10 years on active duty in the United States Navy, flying missions throughout Europe and the Middle East as a helicopter pilot. So excited to be speaking with you, Congressman Sherrill. And uh, let me just start out for a moment. When you, when you came into Congress, uh, your colleagues voted unanimously to make you the chair of the Environment Subcommittee of the House Science Committee. Um, tell us what your priorities are, what your dashboard is, as you take on that responsibility. Well, thanks so much for having me. And um, certainly the environment is something that has been hugely important in my district, a uh, very bipartisan issue. I was proud to help lead the Great American Outdoors Act, which permanently funds the Land and Water Conservation Fund in the House. That was passed with a great deal of bipartisan support in the House and the Senate and signed into law by the president. Um, so, you know, this is this is something that well represents my district. I've been concerned about lead in our drinking water, about scientific integrity, um, making sure we don't roll back some of the critical EPA regulations that have protected our environment here in New Jersey. As, as you may know, we have more Superfund sites in New Jersey than anywhere else in the country. So these are critical issues of concern to us here. Did, did the president invite you to the signing ceremony? I, uh, no, I was not at the signing, sir. He you didn't know, so, so there's still a little politics. Here. So let me ask you, when you, <laughs> when you talk about this, because I know, because I heard Republicans bragging about this legislation that was signed. I've heard Democrats bragging about it. And, and so what worked there that when you walk across that line into other subcommittees in the science committee, do things go, you know, uh, you know begin to diverge? So... You know, it's funny you say that because we as legislators, I think, love to find these pieces of great bipartisan legislation that we can support that so helps our district. And the Great American Outdoors Act, to me, just really funds those things that that make us what we are as a country. So things like George Washington's headquarters here um, in New Jersey, like the the, Nash, the swamp, the great swamp here in New Jersey that gives us our watershed, the Grand Canyon. And, you know, just different special, important places across the country. And so we were able to come together and do that. And people ask me all the time, Mikey, it's so partisan. Can you actually work with people across the aisle? And, and I think, you know, I always say, yeah, there are those issues where there's a great deal of support and we can find those pathways. And a lot of it is having the political will and, and just working incredibly hard to, to build that group of people that is going to carry this not just through the House, but through the Senate and then to get it signed by the president. So let me ask you a very wonky question. We've heard from uh, uh, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson uh, today. We're hearing, uh, we've heard from Franz Cordova, the former head of the National Science Foundation, Susan Hockfield, the former president of MIT. And they have shared that what they see as a problem um, in funding science is the committee structure of the House. That right now, the big next leaps are where biology is converging with engineering and mathematics is converting with energy. And that the committees aren't designed for convergence, they're designed for silos. Do you have any sense of that? Is that assessment correct? And is, is it something that's on anybody's radar screen to begin addressing? Well, this um, something that's been on Chairwoman Johnson's uh, radar for many years now, and I share her concerns. I'm in New Jersey, and, and we had Bell Labs, um, which in, in really bringing together people from all different sorts of backgrounds, metallurgists, engineers, uh, physicists, chemists, we had so many fantastic inventions and seven Nobel Prizes. That's how you get great sciences, bringing so many disciplines together and then funding um, great innovation as we were able to do here with Bell Labs in New Jersey. And so I think she's exactly right. This siloing of how different disparate parts get funded, th that doesn't lead to the great overarching inventions that this country is capable of. You, you've been in national security. You know, you fought for this country. We're a member of the armed forces. Uh, when it comes to looking at what other nations are doing with science and particularly how it enhances their national security, are you worried that the United States is not keeping up with places like China, not making the investments it needs to to keep the U.S. military and the dual use dimensions of that uh, in, in the civilian side of things as robust as our competitors are? Well, we definitely have to modernize. And I'll tell you, when I was coming up, um, you know, when I was growing up, when I was in my early stages in the military, much of the research and development that took place in this country was funded through the Defense Department in places like DARPA, 
And now so much of that research and innovation is taking place in the private sector. And I think we have to, to make sure that we're looking at new ways of aligning our national security with great research and where are the partnerships that we have to have. And certainly we've seen um, China and Russia develop systems of peer or near peer uh, capabilities to our military force. So it's time that we look at modernizing so we can keep that uh, qualitative edge over the other military forces. So does modernizing mean new monies, new research, new investment, you know, for a national problem? I mean, explain to our viewers what the modernization uh, element means. I think it, need, it means better investment. So as, as you know, and so many of your viewers know, we've been looking at small scale contingency wars throughout the world. Um, we've been investing in legacy technologies. It's time we turn towards modernizing our fleet and making sure that where we invest our money is the, the investments that are gonna help us most in the future and not keep, um, you know, not keep investing in legacy technologies that are no longer keeping us on the cutting edge. You know, I, I was just taking another look at, at, at Richard Edelman. Edelman of, of Public Relations does an annual trust barometer. And in this trust barometer, you know, he looks at, you know, people and whether they trust members of Congress, whether they trust scientists, whether they trust businesses, whether they trust the media. And, and what you see is at this moment, trust in scientific authorities, you know, folks like Dr. Fauci and others, has risen really dramatically in the country uh, in, in, this, in this pandemic crisis. But yet we see, and we just can't avoid it, that science seems to have become a, high, a highly political dividing line in this election. How do you feel, like, what are your impressions of that? Um, and are you worried? I mean, I, I've never seen science as, I've seen climate science, but I've never seen science writ large as political as it seems to be at this moment. Well, I, I sort of would agree with that. You know, climate science seems to be the area that became most politicized and has, I think, sort of been the drumbeat of just utilizing science by certain people um, for your own advantage. So we look at Scott Pruitt at the EPA not allowing some of the best scientists in the nation to sit on our scientific integrity boards. Um, we look at him rolling back some of the regulations that have been so important to clean air and clean drinking water in places like New Jersey and trying to roll those back um, for you know, certain political agendas. So I do think it's critical that we stop this politicization of science, that we listen to our scientists. Here in the Northeast, we had the worst outbreak of coronavirus in the nation early on, and we've worked so incredibly hard and we followed, we followed just basically the CDC guidelines. We followed uh, the bipartisan um, specific uh, agenda that, that people have had to say, look, do contact tracing, do testing, wear masks, don't you know, gather together in large groups um, and not keep six feet apart. And this has brought down our cases drastically. And if you look at a heat map of the country right now, you see that right now the Northeast is in much better, a much better place than the majority of the country. We're very concerned about the fall and we're looking at how we make sure we're already looking at get a flu shot. You know, make sure that you have your flu shot so that um, we're not adding flu to the caseload of this pandemic. These are all basic things that I think uh, any scientist, any doctor would tell you to do. They shouldn't be politicized because when we see them politicized across this nation, when we see just wearing a mask as a political statement, we see these horrible outbreaks across the country. It's harming small businesses. It's harming the ability for people. Quite frankly, it's really damaging our children who now can't get back to school. You know, I really appreciate that perspective, and I don't want to put you on the spot or anything. Because you know, we have an election coming up. You're running again. I mean, unfortunately, you've got to run every two years. I feel so sorry for you. But anyway, I'm glad. I'm glad you're doing it. But you know, we have. You know, we'll have uh, uh, Trey Hollingsworth on here in a little while, and we're going to talk to him about science and its importance uh, in in moving the nation forward. But I guess you know, two people I often talk to are Congressman Fred Upton and Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. They do a lot together. They really like each other. He defends her from the president, who often goes after Debbie Dingell. And I often ask my health, you know, after this election is over, uh, no matter who wins, is there, are, are people like you going to find opportunities to work with Republican counterparts and show the American public on issues like science or the issues you have that you can work together and that you're not embarrassed to be in the same room together? Does that make sense? Yeah, it certainly makes sense. And I'm going to do it because I think it's good for the country. I think building broad coalitions of people that believe in the, the things that, that the American people believe in and that's going to move legislative for, legislation forward, create a better future for our kids, I, I think that's good for the country. And that's something I've pledged to my district to continue to do. And, and certainly, um, I'm even doing it before the election. <laughs> so <laughs> where we're going to you know, 
so many of us really want to see Congress work. It's it's not, um, you know, there are so many issues, especially now that we're looking at this global pandemic and how necessary it is to fund some of the basic structures of our government so we can get money out to small businesses and so we can attack this pandemic. Um, it's we need to make sure government works. We need government to be efficient and we need government to serve the people. Well, Representative Mikey Sherrill, member of the House Science, Space and Technology Committee. And, and I just have to say today is fantastic, not only because you're here, but we have so many uh, outstanding women technologists and scientists in today's program. Thank you so much for joining us and good luck uh, in your upcoming race. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you.